here we are. Mm -hmm. I wonder if we could start at the broadest beginnings, which is to ask you to introduce yourself and your practice. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for sending those questions earlier to Michelle. So I had some time to just think about where I want to go with this. Um, but just to preface certain, just to preface where I'm at in my feelings right now about everything is that I am, because it's been such an intense transition period, it's, you know, it's, it's like, I'm feeling quite vulnerable. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just like prefacing in terms of how I might approach things from different angles and maybe not like, like start from the beginning, but maybe also start from the middle in all kinds of ways. So um, it's, it's interesting to me because I just started this job a month and a half ago at Agnes. Um, and it's the first time that I work in a university gallery setting. Although I was an academic for a very long portion of my life, you know, and I feel like this shift has, is having, is putting me in a position where I'm having to think a lot about um, my relationship to the institution all over again differently because I was at, at Plug in ICA before that in Winnipeg. Um, which is a much, a much smaller institutional structure. Um, but to begin, I think I always say that I never imagined that I would be a curator, like as a profession or as a job. It, it would never, I would have never guessed in, <laughs> in the years that I've been doing this, that I would end up doing it um, in a way that is you know, where I can feel comfortable and not worry about income. And I think that's like a really big part of the transition and the shift too. Um, I've worked independently for very long and I think it really started with me being obsessed with film and cinema. And actually Wanda gave me kind of my first like speaking gig like as a, as a student at Trent University <laughs> uh, when she was uh, programming for this um, film festival in Peterborough. And she had me speak to a program that included all these artists, uh, for, a lack of weather, for a lack of a better word, came from the Middle East. Um, and so I feel like um, that is something I always think about is that film studies, cinema, and philosophy really got me to where I am today in terms of my curatorial uh, practice and how I think about it. Um, I also never wanted to be a professor when I did university. <laughs> it was also never something I wanted to like be or make a career out of. So I think for me it was interesting because I started, I did my degrees in film studies in my undergrad well, cultural studies and then film studies in my master's. And then I did an interdisciplinary degree uh, in, uh, in a PhD in humanities at Concordia, uh, where I started uh, to work in geography, uh, art history, and cinema. So then brought all those kind of three disciplines together in my, in my writing and in my work as a researcher. Um, but during my PhD time is when I started to curate uh, a lot independently. Uh, again, mostly like public programs, mostly focused on uh, film screenings, discussions, um, thinking a lot about what the university, uh, what the gallery space can offer for as a gathering spot, as a kind of like as a social uh, um, kind of way of, of really engaging with uh, what we do with what we learn and how we share those ideas. And not just that, but also what the art is doing in terms of how it's affecting or impacting our way of thinking and our way of doing and our way of creating ethics around how we wanna be in the world. I was really interested in, started to become very interested in how art, art, artists through their art practice inspired that in us, inspired us to think of how we can really engage the world differently uh, uh, and transform um, kind of uh, each other and the world through how we create these relationships. Um, and so I felt really uh, blessed to have a lot of opportunities to do that during my PhD since I was funded <laughs> and 
didn't also didn't have to worry about money there, but um, I would, uh, yeah, try to do a lot of um, independent curating there in order to just uh, start kind of moving away from academia as the place in which I wanted to be because it was, uh, you know, it was not making me a happy person. <laughs> I also, I think the moment that I was in school, which was like five years ago now, was when I, when I uh, finished my postdoc. Um, but when I was in school, so it was like 10 years of my life, I started to realize just how different things, um, how quickly things were changing in terms of how uh, the pressure of academia was putting on what it meant to be a writer or what it meant to be a researcher in the world. And I started to feel like completely suffocated by it because I felt like that's not how I wanted to write and it's not how I wanted to think. Not within these, like, even though I was doing interdisciplinary work, I felt like I was really being coerced into being disciplined, which is what I did not want to do ever <laughs> in my life. And that's not how I think. And so it's, and that's not how I want to be. And I also think there is huge issues with that. I also throughout my entire academic education realized how all my professors um, were white. And that a lot of what I was doing while I was there was unlearning already what I was learning in the classroom or having to always do that independent work on the outside. So that's why also like curation and my own independent writing practice started to take form outside of academia because I was trying to create space for myself and for how I felt as a student and how I want and how I wanted to think and who I was inspired by and also who I was having conversations with which were artists and curators outside the academic scope of things. So that's how um, that's kind of just giving you a little bit of like an overview of where I was at. And then um, I started to, um, I got my first job, my first job at Art Metropole. Um, and then um, from there, I went to plug in as curator and then ended up at the Agnes. So yeah, it's been uh, a journey since 2016, I think, yeah. Amazing. Um, given the, the complexity of what you've just shared and um, you know the how how obviously you're bringing together so many different threads and ideas and disciplines in um, the work that you do I wonder you know what did what did you think when we invited you to participate in something called the feminist art field school like yeah, how, does, was, how does the term feminism relate to your thinking? <laughs> I was thinking about that a lot because of, yeah, it was a question too that was in your last email. And I never describe my practice that way. And I have to say, and it's not because of anything. It's because I just, the, I always think of myself as Palestinian first. And that is very much connected to like everything I do any kind of, um, it's like a liberatory mode of being where I'm just like, I all I do is, everything I do is because I'm always thinking about the liberation of my people. So I that's like totally internal and I don't, and even what I just, even how I described it now is just so underwhelming in terms of just the bodily effect that I have, like the, the, the power I, I feel inside me when I think about, that is is beyond words and so i feel like so i wanted to think about this question actually really intentionally because i think the feminism or the feminist practice that um impacts my work is has a lot to do with the relationships that have been in my life so i can't uh, that is not separate from how i'm um, i grow as a person uh, who I consider mentors, who I look up to, who I admire, who are close friends of mine, who are um, just impact my life on, in all of these ways because of the ways that we have these discussions, which is that our practice and, our, and the way we live our life is just not separate. There's no separation. It's just a, a, a dynamic that keeps propelling us toward what we want to think about when it comes to transformation and liberation. So the, 
what was the question in your email though? How is it a feminist practice? I, is that what it was? <laughs> I think it was simpler than that. What is, what is feminism to what you? What is feminist? Yeah, I think, so I can't talk about that without thinking about um, the relationship that I have with Norbesse Philip, who has been in my life for the last five years, who has impacted so much of what I do recently. Um, I feel like I have learned so much from her writing and also just like being in her presence and listening to her, like just, <laughs> just us even on the phone, just talking about whatever it is that is happening in our lives, I think is, I feel like this, this strength and power that she imbues and like gives out into the world through her writing and what she does is like, beyond even the word feminist, because it's just, it's really, it makes me feel like there is, it really teaches me a lot about how to be very, very confident in what I believe in as my values and to continue with them no matter how challenging that could be in the world. Yeah, to continue believing that they will, if, to continue believing in their power in the space in wherever I am so that I can make sure that it's, that I have strength to like keep going in the world. And I feel like she's someone who I look up to in that way because um, there's no compromise. <laughs> there's no compromise in her work, in her writing. Um, and it's like an, an incredible thing to just consistently be reminded of. Um, um, and, and to, yeah, to just like, to, to be uh, lucky enough to, to have that kind of mentorship around me um, is, is what I think feminism is, is having those types of intergenerational relationships that really impact the work that you do in a way that is, uh, holds you accountable, but also gives you confidence in, in, what you believe in and, and what you feel like is uh, um, key to making changes in, in whatever spaces we are, yeah. Um, I think Wanda is also another one, for sure I learn a lot about her and her methodologies because she's someone who I think of, you know, someone who's working inside an institution like the AGO we did a talk together a few years ago and I remember her saying this, I, I can never forget it, but she was just saying like, what I want the museums to feel like for everybody is that feeling and that kind of atmosphere you create in around the kitchen table, you know, when you're cooking a meal with your friends or family and you're just talking and laughing and it's that intimacy of those spaces uh, have, to have that take over in institutions like something like the AGO, I think is, is so key to how I think about also um, as like a feminist practice is really breaking down those kinds of institutional walls that hold on to a specific type of um, uh, uh, exclusion and, and um, you know, it's a coldness that I think is she's breaking down in there too. Um, I also think of Denise Ferra da Silva, who I love so much. I think her work is like so hard. I have to read it over and over again every time. It takes me like four hours to read one page, but every time I'm just like, she's changing everything about like what philosophy is and, and how it has affected and impacted the way we think about everything from like, like race to modernism to uh, I can't even like everything, everything. She's just like tearing down those walls of like the, the thought that have just embedded themselves in the ways that uh, settler colonial culture has created its, um, you know, um, motifs and motives. Yeah. I love this an I love this answer and the roll call of, of mentors and interlocutors is totally extraordinary and one of the things that I'm so inspired by is the way in which 
this conversation can open up portals to mm -hmm. other modes of reading and connection and investigation. And as I was reading the extraordinary list um, of offerings that you sent us prior to the chat, some of the writing yours and some of the writing by others, I wrote down this Philip quote, the struggle is to reduce the gap between the experience and the expression of that yeah, experience. Yeah, totally. yeah. Oh, yeah, and I, I just, know. I just keep, you know, I think I circled it. I came back <laughs> and doodled on it, like something that I just want to continue to think with. And, you know, as I was doing that reading and thinking about our conversation with you, I was thinking about, you know, language, translation, mm -hmm. and curatorial practice mm -hmm. as these mm, actions, problems, mm -hmm. Yeah. Utterances. And I wonder if you might think out loud with us about sort of the relationship between language and translation and curation. Right. Yeah, right. yeah cause it came from that one piece um, in Canadian art. Yeah. I mean, that's also something else I think about a lot because for me, like curatorially, I'm just always trying to figure out why I'm interested in, cause I'm not interested in the actual exhibition space, like not interested in like creating an exhibition. So for me, it's like that translation that happens from um, having just built relationships with the artists that I work with. So a lot of the time, I don't just work with people I don't know. It's, there, are, there are people who have been in my life for many years. We've had many conversations. We've uh, read, ex had exchanges of readings. We've um, been in each other's lives, just cooking, hanging out you know, for, for years and years before I even get to a point where we're just going to do this work together. And, and so the translation of that into an exhibition space or into a gallery is so challenging to, to like have that effect take place. And so for me, it's just the most important thing that what's happening in that moment is that whatever the artists like, I'm there for the artists. I'm just really there to take care of them, to figure out what they want and need in terms of how they want things to happen in any kind of way. And also to take care of the communities who are going to be, um, you know, in, who are, who are going to be um, living in the same place as these exhibitions. What does that mean? How do we, uh, like, those two things are not separate for me. So whenever an artist is, is thinking about an exhibition, and we're going to work together on one. I'm also thinking about the community needs and what's missing for them. What would they want out of something like this? Do they want something? You know, that, that, that's all coming together for me and that's what ends up being in, in presenting a situation in a gallery that's also going to have this like massive public program. I don't even like to call it that because I'm like, it's just part of exhibition making anyway because it's all about trying to figure out how we're going to create spaces of exchange and like in which we come together to uh, think about the questions that arise from the work together and to think about their effect together because the effect of the work I think is like doesn't have language yet until that happens and that's what's most important to me it's really like a social event it's like I just want to have a party with the artists in their exhibition <laughs> with the people who are, you know, uh, who I want to want to invite into this or who want to crash this, you know, <laughs> I want them to crash it. Yeah. Um, in, in one of our earlier conversations, I was um, kind of admitting my frustration um, when I was in grad school about having to study critical theory and never um, having any clarity. The professors never felt the need to like clarify why we were studying it or how it related to the real world. And I am sort of getting the sense from, from the readings that you shared from us and from your comments today that um, even though uh, what you're sort of driving towards in your work is this space of exchange and conversation and people feeling comfortable around the, the kitchen table. Um, uh, and I don't wanna um, lead this conversation somewhere that you don't want it to go if I've misinterpreted this, but here's a line that I loved from your, your text uh, for many returns. 
It's hard to write when I don't feel like it. In truth, I never do. I feel bound to writing. It's a duty, a Palestinian one. And you could have ended the sentence there, but you go on to say a ontological one. Yeah. And I wonder if you could uh, talk about, um, I mean, that whole phrase, but what you, what you mean by um, a ontological one, where that, where that word comes from and how um, that kind of reference um, relates to this visual image that I get that so many people can relate to of like hating to write, but feeling bound to do it. Um, <laughs> it was like a beautiful, like tie in between theory and real life that yeah. I am always looking for. Oh, yeah. I feel like when I use that word, I and in that particular moment too, was because oh my god, I <laughs> this is gonna be like <laughs> I don't even know if this is. Please interject if I'm like not making any sense. But there, it's so hard sometimes to talk about like process because I think we're talking about that connection between like yeah, real world, real life, like, and then writing and doing the thing it's like um for me it's just so hard to put words to process that feels so um bodily so i think when i used that word i was like oh like well first i was just like i'm always bound to deadlines like this is like i just can't and even institutionally thinking about deadlines you know like um like having to have everything um, happen at a certain time because of certain things and I just like it's the only way that gets me to write first of all but also it's something that I just like dread and always um, uh, try to like really push against but in that particular moment I was like I was really feeling like there was something uh, like it's something always bigger than me so when I say it's a Palestinian one I, I don't ever feel like there's like my writing or my curating, like my practice, just as a practitioner, I just feel like that it, I am working for something that is like bigger than my own being and existence in this world. And that's like a huge responsibility. So when I say duty and, the, and how it's connected to a ontological one is because I'm like, that is literally what I'm haunted by is that I can't in that, like I landed here and on someone else's land because I couldn't be on mine because my grandparents had to leave. And that whole, that whole like migration story or forced displacement and dispossession from land to is not separate from where I am here. And there is a huge haunting there for me. There is no way that I would lead a life here on these lands and thinking about where I come from and not have, not make everything I do about how I'm going to bring uh, language to that. That's a, a huge responsibility. And, I, and I'm not, I don't want to shy for it. It doesn't scare me, but it's, it's very powerful and it feels like I am pulled by it. And that's, that's because it's like, that's what I want to be working toward is thinking a lot about how those conditions create like an, a responsibility that leads us to an ethical way of forming how we want to be in the world. And I, and I really hate using the word ethics, but I also think it's important because it's always in uh, creation. It's always in uh, conversation with the environment we're in and with the people we're around. And I feel like I learned that a lot from um, the exhibition I co-curated with Jennifer Smith called Sovereign Intimacies. When we were really discussing these relationships, she's like, you know, you, I just realized I don't know anything really that much about Palestine. And now that I'm getting to know you, I like, I need, need to learn. And we were talking about these exchanges that like that that's what I'm doing here all the time too is now when I landed in the prairies that was new 
learning for me. I had to learn all over again because I'm on a different territory. I'm on a different land. There's a different history here too, but that's part of this bigger one. And so we're really thinking about these exchanges as being so detrimental to this, you know, to how relationships are created and how through these relations, these intimacies come out and that those are the ones that lead us toward how we want to engage together and be with each other and learn how to be with each other if we want to and also to create work from that that is going to inspire a different way of contextualization and a, and that interjects with what we already think we know and so that's i don't know if that makes sense i think that was that like the haunting went into that project <laughs> Answer. Yeah. I wonder if you might try on an, a, a conversational experiment with me mm -hmm. in so far as I'm so compelled by your thinking out loud about ethics and the even while we problematize that word and the ways in which art and artists can inspire ethics, I think was part mm -hmm. of your phrasing earlier on in our conversation. And as someone who's invested in cinema and media who works most often in documentary space, I think a lot about accountabilities and ethics and authorship and the relationship between those things. And I'm also aware that we are building a field school where people are coming from a variety of different disciplines and interests, some of whom may be very new to encountering art in public. And I was wondering if you might be able to tell us about a time where you encountered work that made you think about ethics or ethically or the role of art in a production of a new ethical way. Yeah, yeah, totally. Wow, yeah, an artist's work. Um, okay, before that, I do wanna say though, if before I get to the work, I wanna just preface by saying that I also um, learned deeply this is a separate separate from my like art life my writing maybe not my writing life but my art life in some ways but that i at some point you know when i started to think a lot about um how to think and this was because of uh reading el wiseman's book on the architecture of occupation uh he's in his you know the israeli architect who's you know now part of forensic architecture and they do all that incredible work but I was like, how do I, because I started teaching also around that time, this was like 10 years ago, and I was like, how do I think about, um, uh, you know, making Palestine like a global issue? Because it, intuitively, I knew it was. Intuitively, I always knew it was. You grow up in these situations, you know, this is not just about, like, uh, you know, an identity thing, right? This is about a bigger situation in which uh, uh, is connected to these other, um, uh, you know, very violent modes of like occupations and col colonialism and imperialism. So I was thinking a lot about how am I going to make this actually really prevalent in the Canadian context, um, that it goes beyond just settler colonialism as we understand it here in so-called Canada. But it's like, so I started to think a lot about prisons. And I was like, again, intuitively, I was like, I, I knew intuitively, I was like, really believed in prison abolition, and like, had not really done like, all the work in reading about it. So when I think of, I just want to say, when I think about ethics and accountability, I also think about what prison abolition from way back pre 2020, <laughs> way back, all the work that was done for a very long time by all these incredible black feminists, critical resistance, Ruth Gilmore, all these incredible people who are just writing so much about uh, how we're going to think about prison abolition as like separate from any kind of uh, uh, state sanctioned violence or state sanctioned kind of systems. And so that to me was like really also a driving force in terms of making me think about what are my values? How, how do like in, in like a very kind of like pragmatic way. And I was like, how do I think about accountability 
in these other ways. And it was always very much about, so I really delved in. I was like, you know, I started, I joined a collective where we were doing visits inside and I was with that collective for seven years. Cause I was like, there's no way, there's so little information about Canadian prisons. Again, this was like 10 years ago at that time. And there was so much about US prison system. So I was like, there's no way to know what's going on here without also making those connections. So that was really important for me and important for me, not just as like someone who uh, is wanting to be accountable in the world, but like also someone who wants to be a good teacher because I'm like, you can't like, um, or a caring teacher, I, sh I should say. <laughs> <laughs> Although I have heard I am a good teacher, but <laughs> I am a very caring teacher. And so I was like, I really want the students to understand that what happens here um, through these, like, through the prison infrastructures is not separate from colonization and is not separate from what's happening in Palestine and elsewhere, because these, these ways of, um, these kinds of architectures, the way they're engineered and then made global and imported and exported have a lot to do with these um, um, uh, bigger relationships that are taking place um, in such a look at what's happening in, in Afghanistan, for example. So I just want to preface that by saying that. So it's not usually that I look at an like specifically at an artist's work that gives me that kind of pragmatic perspective on, on what it means to be accountable and ethical to my communities and my people. And, and it starts with, you know, it starts with me and how I am with my community of people. But it's, it's also has a lot to do with what I've learned so much from uh, prison abolition organizers, writers, people on the inside who I had relationships with. And um, that for me gave me a lot of um, perspective, again, on how relationship building is so important for that. You know, it's not the work itself or it's not the you know, the work that is the outcome. It's not that the artist's work that becomes like what we put in an exhibition. It's more like the relationships we're creating around us and what that does, yeah. I didn't answer your question. <laughs> Oh, it's spectacular. I was just uh, just giving Michelle time to unmute. Yeah, it's a great answer. Okay, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. When um, when we do media training uh, at the museum, um, we're told that if we're asked a question we don't like to just answer the question we wish we were asked. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And um, uh, I mean, we we're asking you a lot of questions about the, the writings that you shared with us. And maybe mm -hmm. we, didn't, we didn't intend to go on for so long because we, we don't wanna like hash it all out so that the students don't have to read anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I'm so interested in, in what you just said about, um, you know, uh, um, Palestine being a global issue that everybody should should care about. And certainly when I was reading the texts that you shared with us, um, especially um, the, the Phillips text, uh, which speaks yeah. so sort of mm -hmm. eloquently and insightfully about um, histories of slavery, um, I was just, you know, kind of overwhelmed by mm -hmm. these parallel narratives of um, mm -hmm. uh, the colonial project and mm -hmm. and how how we are all connected um, through through these legacies, mm -hmm. these histories that that mm -hmm. we embody. And um, I wonder, um, you know, practically how, how you move um, from this space of the text of, of art, um, like what, I guess what I'm asking is what am I supposed to do now? You know, you've, <laughs> you, you've made the message clear. <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> Michelle, you're already doing it. 
I just read this incredible interview with you in Canadian art, actually. I used it in my interview at Agnes <laughs> as inspiration on how to think about collections. That was so amazing to see that, you know, I was really inspired a lot by how you thought of access there. And I think this is the, I think so many of us are already doing it in wherever we are. This is what I mean. It's like, um, we start from here, you know, and move outward. And it's just how we're taking care of things in the, in the power positions that we have, in the privileged positions that we have. When you talked about access, I was thinking so much about how I think about institutions too. And it was that, you know, it's, they're a resource. They're a building with people, with money, <laughs> and lots of technology, lots of equipment, lots of staff power, lots of like all these other things that I'm just like, wow, look at what we have, but like, just like at our arm's reach. And how are we, what are we going to do that? For me, I'm like, how do we bring that out to the people who really like want to use this, you know, who really could use it and how are we going to, and that would be how we change things in terms of also breaking down those walls. Because I really, I'm like, it's just like an abundance. It's like an abundance of, of, of so much that, that needs to be just like funneled outward, you know, and not contained within. And I feel like, and then the other thing I think about is just, there's like this emphasis on like the institution, like having a voice, like as if it's like a bit dissociative. It's really weird because I'm like, there are people in the institution. The institution is the people. And like, it's, we're inside it. And it's as if there's something that I don't understand that like pivot from what, what we have power and control over. And then this thing called like the institution, because this is for me, like, like, it's like a, it's like a real, like, relationship that's consistently happening and so I think it's really up to us from within to think about how much we can do from and I know it comes with limitations but still I feel like those can be really challenged sometimes you know and from where we are and to push up against that um it's really hard I think because I also have Emily as like at the helm of <laughs> this <laughs> this situation and she's also very inspiring in that way with her whole concept of in reach or methodology it's not a concept it's a methodology it's a practice um you know of really thinking about the you know institution as something that can be really um um yeah changed from within and bring it out as well and i think that's something it's like to be aligned again, to be working with people who, where values are aligned, uh, gives so much power to trying to transform those spaces for the artists that I care about and, and, and uh, want to be with forever <laughs> and bring them in and me going out there too, you know, and then also being out there in the communities that I feel like is so integral to thinking. For me, I don't separate, I really feel like we can make art very, uh, um, how do I say this? We can really, as like curators and my responsibility here, I feel like there's like a responsibility to, to make it feel like um, anyone can have access to it, but that people already understand it. And it's like my job to make sure that it's just that they're getting what they need out of it, you know? And I don't, and I don't want to ever assume that nobody gets art or that um, I don't even, even when people say, well, like, I don't know about art. I don't know if I get it. I'm like, I think like you do, trust me. And it's like a challenge to be like, I'll show you how, because you already are thinking it, you know, and you're already doing it in your life probably. And like, you're, we're already like um, thinking about these things together. And it's just a matter of like activating that, like that space and conditioning an environment in which we can all be speaking together about it in, in, and bringing that difference together. That's what I love it is that we are all different. We all come from these different backgrounds, but then 
there can be a situation where then we're just learning so much from each other. And to create spaces like that is so, it's like so important for me, especially in places like when I was in Winnipeg and then in Kingston, these spaces aren't thought of a lot, right? There's like such a, like a, I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, Michelle also, yeah, in Victoria or Regina, right? It's just, it's been like these centers like Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, but it's like, there are all these other places that are doing so much and uh, already these like communities that are out there that I'm just like, is so important to engage with and so important to start making relationships with because they add so much to the conversation and change it, change it. I mean, I think that is the most glorious of, of a send off in some ways. <laughs> I would love to keep chatting, but there's something really quite extraordinary there too about the relationship between what you just said and the steadfast commitment that a public program is not separate from an exhibition, that we're not you know, having educational moments around something that isn't already otherwise educational. And I know that your new position at the Agnes is technically branded as educational, correct? And is about a kind of relationship to programming. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, what do you think about education as a concept in these contexts? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, education, I don't like when I think of that, I'm just, I'm really in a situation where, um, just um, a facilitator. Like I'm not, I'm learning and also facilitating, you know? And I think it's in terms of trying to think about programs in that way, I'm like, I wanna bring, I wanna be in conversation with all the young people. I wanna know what they want. I wanna know what they need. I wanna know what they hate about art, what they love about art if they give a shit about art, if they don't, that's cool. I just wanna know how I can be in conversation with them in order to make that space a good one for them. Like a space where they're like, I wanna just come here and hang out. I wanna know that I can just come by and say hi to Nazrin if I want to. I wanna know that I can just come by and hang out by the front steps or just like be in the gallery space and just like, whatever do whatever but it's like that's the kind of image I have of like education public programming it's more just like creating like a, a kind of hub in which people feel like they can just come and talk do their thing hang out and then we collaborate and then we think together on something and that eventually the programming would come out of those conversations you know and it's it's really like a it's an interaction it's an exchange it's like a it's a collaboration, yeah. And so I just think of my position in that regard as like facilitating that, making, trying to figure out how to make that kind of space come alive, yeah. You've, um, you've already spoken so eloquently about um, how you think about institutions. So I don't want to belabor the, the um, question that, um, we typically ask next, uh, uh, which is about what is the role of um, institutions in, mm -hmm. in making more just futures. Um, I think that we understand enough about your practice mm -hmm. uh, now to, to sort of merge our last two questions. And I'm going to ask, you know, what's, what's next for you and how are you going to use the institution that you're now in to make more just futures? Everyone, well, I feel like when you walk around Kingston <laughs> and the impression that many people have is that it's very white. And I think it's not, I think it's not. And I think I'm like, I know it's not. And I got to figure that out. Because I'm like, this is actually like where the even just geographically, if you look at a map, just where the university is, is like, wow, next to this like super fancy neighborhood right by the waterfront. So it's just like geographically, I'm, I'm really grappling with like, how is this going to happen, you know, in terms of bringing the universe, bringing the gallery out into community, bringing the community also into the gallery. 
And I'm just, for me, that's the next step. I'm like, it's so like day to day. I'm like slowly just wanting to make connections with people here um, who I think like I did also in Winnipeg. I think I talked to so many amazing, incredible young BIPOC artists. I love young artists. I don't know why. <laughs> like, I just, they're so smart. They're so on it. I couldn't even have asked for better company when I was there and better community because we just, we got super close. I just met with them like every week. We had parties, we did studio visits. We talked about everything they cared about. We, I wanted to know, and that's what I want to do here. I just want to connect with people here with the young BIPOC students and the artists who are just like, like craving for something to happen. And I want to, you know, like, make that happen for them if it, ha if it can at Agnes, you know? And I wanna know what they're doing, what they're working on. And if it's like, if there's any kind of, you know, a possibility for collaboration and, and that for me, it's so important to just start with building relationships and those take time and like building trust takes time. And I think that's just like, it's like a different time frame. It's like actually just being like, this is, how it's going to be. Something might not happen for like a year because I'll just need to do this for a while. Yeah, until I figure out, until I figure out like who my community is here and how we're going to change things up at those front doors. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. Deeply appreciate your insights and, and perspective. And, oh. you know, I've, I've been furiously taking notes and, you know, there was something you said about making spaces feel good and, and wanting the gallery or the space of your program to be somewhere where people want to hang out. And I really resonate deeply and, and, and hope that that is part of the many things we're trying to do with this field school space is open up doors and windows and, and say like, come hang out and what can happen when we're all hanging out here together. So appreciate oh, your- yeah. Oh, thank you so much for this invitation. I hope I didn't speak too generally about things. Sometimes I tend to do that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it's so hard it feels so like abstract and it's not it's just so bodily <laughs> spectacular fantastic it was fantastic i'm not somebody who like typically spends a lot of time looking back or longing for the past but i wish that there was some way that i could sort of invert time and be a student at queen right now instead of having been there 30 years ago when I like I went into the Agnes twice and um, the only place I could find to hang out was film house. I don't even know if film house still exists, but it was. Oh, like, I'm going to try to look it up. Film house. Okay. Did you also know that Michelle Pearson Clark was here? Was I a did, student at Queens? I did not know that. Oh. Yeah. In the 90s. I wondered if, were you guys there together? No, I would have been there before her. I think I'm a little, I'm, I know I'm a little older than Michelle Pearson Clark. Okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. She was talking about being in the African and Caribbean student group, which still exists now. Yeah. It still exists. Yeah. 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 That's where I met, that's where I first met um, Gigi Basanta. Oh, amazing. Gigi and I were at at Queens together. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> there are so many people who went here. I know. I mean, <laughs> not to talk about it too much. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm plotting. I'm plotting for your visit. I'm sure Emily's plotting for your visit. <laughs> Bring you out here to do something. That would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Well, we will keep you posted, um, literally and otherwise. The modules will live online, hopefully, for a long time. And so we'll definitely link you up. And um, uh, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really appreciate it. It's always so helpful for me to talk about what I do. So I really appreciate this time. And Thank you for thinking of me. I'm actually so honored and humbled. Like, I'm just like, I'm so shy. I can't even believe that I was one of all, like in with all those other incredible, amazing artists and curators. So 
I thank you. <laughs> I don't have any more words. <laughs>